MC Owens, and this is part two of the Vimalakirti experience. And the Vimalakirti experience, of course, is this series of coordinated classes that I'm doing with my fellow SFDC teacher, Michael Taft. And so he's teaching med guided meditations on Thursday nights that correspond to the classes I'm doing here on Sunday nights. And so together it's creating the experience. Um, and so tonight is a continuation uh, for me of last Sunday, but I'm also going to try to weave in a few things that uh, Michael dropped on us on Thursday in that lovely uh, meditation. Um, so this is going to be part two, and actually tonight is even a little crazier than last week because we're going to try to do uh, three chapters in one night. And since I'm going to be trying to do three chapters in one night, I'm actually not going to do as much reading. Um, I'm going to actually do it a little more of, I kind of have two modes that I teach in. I either read a lot and then we talk about it, or I kind of go line by line and back and forth where I read a line, maybe try to break it down, get some Q&A, do another line. I think it's going to be that kind of night. Uh, just because we're we're going to go deep tonight. Um, and so that means I'm not going to read as much verbatim from the text. Um, so I've really pulled out a lot of juicy, nice parts of each of the three chapters that we're going to be looking at. Uh, so there's that. Um, I do have a quick recap or a review of last week. It's a couple of ideas that have lingered, uh, either lingered for me or they came up after Michael Taft's uh, meditation or they sort of came up in terms of these three chapters and then I wanted to remind you of something that has already happened. Um, so on that note I wanted to just remind us that whole first chapter we read last time and I read it in, in its entirety. Um, that first chapter was kind of a hybrid of the Chinese in the, in the Sanskrit version and kind of putting together my own uh, this reading of chapter two was pretty much straight out of the Robert Thurman translation. Uh, there's a few things going on with that. If you're reading along, I am reading mainly from the Robert Thurman translation, but as everybody knows, when I read these sutras by other translators, I'm always, uh, changing a lot of words because I want it to match the language that I use when I teach or that Michael Taft uses when he teaches. And it may not be the same words that Robert Thurman has chosen. So a lot of what I'm doing is not so much uh, translating as kind of rephrasing to make it consistent with the language that I use. So that's one thing that I wanted to make clear about this reading. This first chapter, right? I said a number of things last week about how with, with Mahayana Sutras in particular, that first chapter is usually the whole message of the sutra in, in one event. Like one thing happens that encapsulates the whole message of the sutra. And then you'll get the sutra, uh, the same exact message played out in multiple chapters. So I wanted to remind us that that opening chapter was a, conden a condensing of the whole sutra. But there was a really great question, or actually it was just a comment, a great comment that Eric made, which was about the list of bodhisattva names in Sanskrit. Uh, Michael Taft and I have been going back and forth all week with these names, like really getting in deep with the meaning of them and how they're, they're working with the text. And Eric made that comment about, you know, this sort of you know, lineages and the, this uh, chanting of the names of teachers and these kind of lineages. And there's definitely that going on. And the one thing that I wanted to say that I don't really think I said last time about that opening chapter, the purification of Buddha fields or the purifying of Buddha lands. Yeah, the teaching was about the Bodhisattva purifies their mind, purifies their Buddha realm by working on the paramitas, generosity, discipline, patience, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm also, you know, always reminding us that reading these sutras and especially Mahayana sutras, it's like, yeah, this is sort of prescriptive in terms of like 
hey, maybe you should work on your generosity and your discipline. And, and so it's prescriptive prescribing you some action. But as a story, this purification of the Buddha field, the evoking or invoking of these lists of names, I want you to sort of recognize that that opening chapter is sort of like, I don't know how to put this, but if you, if you think of reading a sutra, like we're doing, but if you were to think of it as of just yourself reading a sutra as a, as a rite, an R-I-T-E rite, right, as a ritual, then that opening chapter is like a purifying ritual, you know, and so in the same way that if you were going to do an actual ritual, you would kind of purify or clear the space and then do your ritual in it. Well, that opening chapter for the mind of the reader, for our minds, that was like a purification to get us ready. So it's functioning that way too. I just wanted to kind of point that out. Um, and one last thing on that too, trying to draw these connections between Anatha Pindika, this uh, donor, the great donor of Buddhism and his relationship as the provider of shelter or housing for the Sangha. And so then this gets played out in this sutra with this miraculous parasol that covers the whole multiverse, right? Where the Buddha takes all these little individual parasols and makes one giant one. It's a little unfortunate not doing the whole sutra in one night because part of the other kind of mystical beauty of this is that the entire rest of the sutra is taking place under that canopy, right? So we've kind of created this safe, peaceful, purified space to read this sutra in, and it's all going to be under the shelter of this magical parasol. And then we go forward. So I just wanted to remind us that we are all under a bejeweled, <laughs> miraculous parasol, very safe, very peaceful here, right? And that's where this all takes place. Then we moved on to chapter two, where we were introduced to the star of the show, Vimalakirti himself. And I had a, just a few things I wanted to say about him real quick. Um, this, so I set up this sutra as like, it's kind of like the Mahayana Sutra par excellence. It's like the really great introduction to like, what is Mahayana Buddhism versus the other Buddhism, Theravada or Hinayana Buddhism. The, as I introduced it last week, this sutra is about that discourse. Uh, the discourse between what are called Shravakas or disciples, followers, and then the Bodhisattva path. I set that up last week that there's an opposition going on between sort of the old school and new school. Well, that's just going to keep going. Okay. But I wanted in, in terms of the old school to new school, I wanted to point out something and this is, um, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm doing this thing where I tried to set up Vimalakirti with a few preliminary sutras. Uh, one was the Sudatta Sutra. Sudatta is going to appear in the chapter four here. The Sudatta is the name of Anathapindika, his, his birth name. We read that one, and then we read the Anathapindika Sutra proper, the advice of Anathapindika, which he's sick, he's at home, he's in his bed. The Buddha says somebody should go check on Anathapindika. There's a lot of corollaries between these two sutras. And so if you've listened to that talk or you were here for the Anathapindika talk, I want to remind us all of something that happens in that sutra. Anathapindika is a white robed wearing lay person, right? He's not a monk. He's not a renunciant in that way. And, but he's beloved. He's beloved by the Buddha. He's beloved by the Sangha. And so when they go to see him and he says like, yeah, I'm sick. My body's sick. I'm, it's getting worse. It doesn't look good. Shariputra, who's a, the first monk who's going to appear, he appeared last week too, Shariputra gives Anathapindika this advice. And this advice 
and I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna try to do this delicately to not overwhelm us with too many ideas at first, but the advice that Shari Poocher gave to Anatha Pindika was a, about not clinging to or being attached to anything pertaining to the six realms, anything of the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, or even the, even the mind. One should have no attachment or clinging to it, transcend the triple world as it's called, the realm of desire, the realm of form, even the formless realm. Transcend all of that. And I wanted to just introduce a language tonight that I, I think I'm gonna probably wind up using. And it's the language of identification, identifying as I don't know, uh, identifying as a husband, right? I identify as a husband because I'm married. So that's one of my qualities is that. Perhaps identifying as Michael, identifying as my parent's child, all sorts of ways in which I could identify myself, my occupation, my gender, my sex, my, the list goes on and on and on and on of what I could identify with. And then this process of identifying also goes to all those objects out in the world. How do I know this is a whiteboard? Well, I could identify it by its marks and its characteristics, what in Buddhism are called lakshana, right? And so this process of identifying, identifying with and identifying by way of, the, the really simple way to explain Shariputra's advice to Anathapindika is to not identify <laughs> at all. <laughs> not to transfer one's identification as a this with a that. Oh, I identify as a lay person, but now I'll identify as a, a monk. Or I, I used to identify as this, and then I'll identify as that. Shari Putra's advice was not to identify with anything, not to identify with the self, the body, not to identify other things as things based on their qualities or characteristics, and to ultimately be in a state of non-attached, non-clinging, non-identification. It's kind of a very, it's a practice. It's truly a concentration practice of not allowing the mind to rest and settle on identifying as this or that, or settling and identifying this as a whiteboard or that as a laptop. So it's that easy, gentle disposition towards everything, including oneself, that is not clinging. Yeah? That was Shariputra's advice to Anathapindika. The really, really significant part about that sutra is that Shariputra says, yeah, the Buddha doesn't usually teach this stuff to lay people. And, and Anatha Pandika says, you should teach this stuff to lay people. This is important information. And so I want you to, if you didn't, if you weren't here for that sutra, think about it. If you were here, think about it. That that message of let's not keep this just for the renunciants. There are lay people with little dust in their eyes too. Little dust meaning that they have little attachments to things of this world too. So they'll be able to hear that. So that little seed of like, hey, maybe we should take this insider knowledge and spread it around. That's a Mahayana move. And so I can, again, like I'm always doing, I'm trying to show you that the seeds of all of this later Buddhism are very, very present in the early teachings, right? So that's a little recap about Anathapindika and his relationship to Vimalakirti. The last thing before we get into some new stuff is that I wanted to remind us about this really amazing guy, Vimalakirti, right? Uh, the landlord of landlords, right? The businessmen of businessmen, the aristocrat of aristocrats, right? Well, without, again, without, I want to jump into new stuff and I don't want to lose too much time on old stuff. So I just wanted to point this out about the overarching message of this sutra and maybe how to think of it or how to read it. Um, 
you know, one way is to think that the Malakirti wasn't a historical person and this is a story or a, a, a document about him, maybe, maybe. But because of the, the message of the sutra and actually the Mahayana Bodhisattva message in general, when the sutra says he's the landlord of landlords, the aristocrat of aristocrats, I think a way to read it not the only way, but a way to read it is that if you've ever had a noble landlord, a respectable landlord, then that was Vimalakirti. That was a bodhisattva. And they're everywhere. These bodhisattvas are everywhere. They manifest. You don't even know it. It could be your landlord. It could be your boss. It could be your employer. It could be all of these different things. And if they're noble, act in accordance with the Dharma, then maybe they're Vimalakirti. In other words, that might be the message when it says like that giant list of qualities of Vimalakirti, they might be talking about one person or they might be talking about, they might be talking about the message that I left you with last week. And that message was this idea of Old school Buddhism with the creation of a monastery or a vihara was about creating a safe place from the world. The world is suffering. The world is nuts. It's Mara's domain. It's the devil's domain. So let's carve out a safe little place from the world, create a refuge, and get people to come to the refuge. That was the old program of Buddhism, to create a refuge from the world. What I suggested last week was that a way of thinking of the Mahayana, the great vehicle, is that the, the project is to turn the world into a safe refuge. Not to carve out just one little niche, but actually to change the whole thing. And so in order to do that, in order to transform the whole world into a safe refuge, we're going to need the landlords to get on board. We're going to need the employers to get on board. We're going to need all the bodhisattvas to engage and, 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 and get into action. So that I think is part of this Vimalakirti message here. So in other words, going forward, it's fun and, and interesting to think of him as an individual person that is that smart, that enlightened, that you know advanced. But it's also interesting to think of him as representing the bodhisattvas in the world, all of them. All right. So that's old territory. Any questions about old territory before we move to chapter three, chapter four, and chapter five? Gulp. Okay. So we're doing three chapters. Uh, you should know that in the... Uh, I think it's the Chinese version. It could be the Tibetan version. It's in one of them. Uh, chapter three and chapter four are one chapter. It's sort of part A, part B. So maybe we're only doing two chapters tonight. You be the judge. The first chapter that we're doing, chapter three, is called the Shravakas. And I've done many, many Dharma talks on this interesting term, Shravaka. Shravaka, voice, vasha. And, and to hear the voice, so they're voice hearers. Long, interesting history of this term, um, especially in the Manichaean tradition where they talk about shravakas and hearing voices, which is kind of actually like hearing voices, like <laughs> going a little crazy, but in the best possible way. In the, this tradition, of course, the Buddhist tradition, the Buddhist Mahayana tradition, the shravakas, voice hearer is a term for the monks the disciples who heard, they were there, they heard the voice of the Buddha. And as I've said, it's kind of a der slightly derogatory or pe pejorative, slightly pejorative term for follower, like just someone who's following, but in a way not fully thinking for themselves in that way. They're kind of just following along. That's a little bit of the critique. So we're going to be uh, hearing 10 stories about the 10 great arhats. These are the 10 classic followers of the Buddha. And I'll tell you 
a little story about each of them when we get there. So that's going to be chapter three. Chapter four, though, is about these four bodhisattvas. These are going to be sort of contrasted to our followers. And then finally, the heart of tonight will be chapter five. Uh, Manjushri, the Bodhisattva of Wisdom, Dharma Prince, and basically a little repartee between Manjushri and Vimalakirti. Okay. So that's the course of the evening. Um, uh, like I said, I'm gonna not. I'm gonna do the thing where I read a little bit, stop, read a little, read a little bit, stop. So, um, at any point, please just stop me if you have a question. Um, this in the Chinese, this chapter is just called the disciples or the Shravakas. Um, in the Sanskrit, it has a slightly more descriptive title, which is it's about the Shravakas or the disciples' reluctance to go see Vimalakirti. All right. So then, oh wait, one more thing. I, this was important. Last week, we heard from Vimalakirti, right? And, and in fact, the way I put it, the way I said it, Vimalakirti gave the Anatha Pindika Sutra. Shariputra's message to Anatha Pindika that I just went over is the same message that Vimalakirti now gives to the people. And this is a really subtle but important point, which is why I needed to backtrack. The idea of this sutra is that we are about to start embarking on a step-by-step -step journey towards enlightenment. <laughs> and what's interesting about that is that, well, Vimalakirti's uh, Dharma talk about sickness, Dharma talk about the illness of the body, and he says, friends, this body is so frail. It's so subject to change and this, don't identify with it. Don't cling to it. That, that's his message, right? It's very, very important to know that within this tradition, what they're saying is, is that for the masses, for the people, Vimalakirti teaches this way. He teaches the old message. He teaches Shariputra's old school message. But that's not the end of the story that is in terms of upaya or in terms of skillful means that's just what the people are ready to hear so tonight we're going to go deeper because you're about to hear vimalakirti's advice not to the people but to the the hardcore the 10 hardest core monks right so it's going to get progressively Mm, more profound. So I just wanted to point that out as this goes along. So then, the Lichavi Vimalakirti thought to himself, I'm sick, lying on my bed here in pain. Yet the Buddha, the Tathagata, the Arhat, the perfectly accomplished one, does not consider me or take pity on me and he sends no one to inquire about my illness. The world-honored one knew this thought in the mind of Vimalakirti and said to the venerable Shariputra, Shariputra, go to inquire after the illness of the Lichavi Vimalakirti. Thus having been addressed, the venerable Shariputra answered the Buddha, world-honored one, I'm a little reluctant to go ask the Lichavi Vimalakirti about his illness. Why is that? Well, I remember one day when I was sitting at the foot of a tree in the forest, absorbed in dhyana, absorbed in meditation, absorbed in contemplation. And the Lichavi Vimalakirti came to the foot of, foot of that tree and said to me, Venerable Shariputra, this is not the way to absorb yourself in meditation. 
you should absorb yourself in meditation so that neither the body nor the mind appear anywhere in the triple world, the realm of desire, the realm of form, or the formless realm. You should absorb yourself in meditation in such a way that you can manifest all ordinary behavior without forsaking your cessation. You should absorb yourself in meditation in such a way that you can manifest the nature of an ordinary person without ever abandoning, abandoning your cultivated spiritual nature. You should absorb yourself in meditation so that the mind neither settles within nor moves without towards external forms. You should absorb yourself in meditation in such a way that the 37 aids to enlightenment are manifest without deviation toward any conviction. You should absorb yourself in meditation in such a way that you are released in liberation without abandoning the passions that are the province of this world. Venerable Shariputra, those who absorb themselves in contemplation or meditation in such a way are declared by the world honored one to be truly absorbed in meditation. World honored one, when I heard this teaching of the Malakirti, I was unable to reply and I remained silent. Therefore, I'm a little reluctant to go ask that good man about his sickness. So that's our first Shravaka, Shariputra. Shariputra should be quite familiar to us now. We, he popped up last. Uh, he's the one that got schooled by Vimalakirti last time, or by the Buddha last time, I should say, when the Buddha put his toe on the ground. This dynamic, by the way, where Vimalakirti, who's a bodhisattva, we've been told he's a bodhisattva. He's actually like the bodhisattva par excellence, right? So this, um, this formula or this relationship of a bodhisattva turning and saying something to Shariputra, that's the essence of the Heart Sutra. That's the essence of this Mahayana structure where a bodhisattva turns to the Shariputra primarily, a monk, and explain something to them. All right, so that's interesting. Any questions or ideas about this idea of uh, meditation absorption and Vimalakirti's idea of real meditation absorption? Yeah, no. Oh. Thank you, Michael. Uh, yeah. yeah, I really appreciate that. What a, what a, what a great line. And you practice it at all times in sundry in, in your daily life, in your daily movements. I, I certainly appreciated that. There's lots of underlines in that, that one paragraph. Thank you. Yeah, yeah no, and I, I really think that is, I mean, I've said this about this sutra. It's so rich, so many meanings, the top of meanings, but I think the main driving meaning of that passage is this idea that one should always be in meditation, always everywhere, not just under the foot of the tree, not just in the zendo, you know, that it is this, like a lifetime practice or a constant practice in that way. Yeah. All right, let, you ready for another Shravaka? And, and I want you to just recognize that there's kind of a very thin line between the message that the Malakirti gave to the people and this message. It's pretty similar. It's pretty similar in terms of not being attached to anything anywhere. But now we're going to go a little deeper. All right. Um, our next monk uh, is uh, Madhuryayana. Madhuryayana is very famous for uh, having all the supernatural powers, the Siddhis. He's always uh, floating around on his little like kind of clouds and zipping around the multiverse. Um, so he's an interesting guy for that. And then the Buddha said to the venerable Maha Madhulyayana, Madhulyayana, go to the Lichavi Vimalakirti to inquire about his illness. Madhulyayana replied, world honored one, I'm indeed a little reluctant to go to the Lichavi Vimalakirti to inquire about his illness. Why is that? 
I remember one day when I was teaching the Dharma to the householders in a square in the great city of Vaishali, and the Licha Vivimalakirti came along and said to me, Venerable Madhulyayana, that is not the way to teach the Dharma to the householders clothed, clothed in their white robes. The Dharma must be taught according to reality. Venerable Madhulyayana, the Dharma is without living beings because it is free of the dust of living beings. It is selfless because it is free of the dust of desire. It is lifeless because it is free of birth and death. It is without personality because it dispenses with past origins and future destinies. Pause. <laughs> so my Guyana is a heavy hitter, right? And I would like, so I pointed out a moment ago, the Heart Sutra, the, the relationship between Shariputra and the, this kind of Bodhisattva Mahayana message, right? Well, for those uh, in the audience that are familiar with the Diamond Sutra, or as I translate it, the Vajra Sutra, the entire Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra, the whole Diamond Sutra, is about four lakshana, four qualities or characteristics that things are living, like the quality of something as a living being versus like my laptop here that I do not think has the qualities of a living being, right? Selflessness, lifelessness, and personality, or in the words of the Vajra Sutra, individuality. So these qualities that something is a being with a self and with a what in the language of the diamond or the diamond sutra, Vajra Sutra, a lifespan. There are these qualities that something is existent as a living being was born somewhere, will die somewhere, and therefore has a lifespan. And that within that lifespan, there is a consistent personality or individuality. The whole message of the Vajra Sutra or the Diamond Sutra is that those particular lakshana, those particular qualities or characteristics are equally constructed, equally artificial, equally, um, equally unpossessed, if that makes sense. And so to sort of start going a little deeper, the idea is, so I identify as Michael. I identify as Michael the husband. I identify as Michael the husband who is a teacher. So my occupation, my relationship, right? And then my name identifier. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, yeah. And I'm Michael Owens, father of Howard, right? Of fa or sorry, son of Howard Owens. So I have these relationships, right? And so, well, who, who's Michael? Michael's son of Howard, husband to Holland, the teacher guy, <laughs> right? So these, these um, identifiers, lakshana, like occupation, marital status, sex, gender, and so on, right? There's one, I already did it a moment ago, there's a simple Dharma lesson, which is about not identifying with those things, which we know are temporary and impermanent to begin with. You know, you know like I'm a teacher right now, but that's because you're listening, and so that makes you students. <laughs> so you identify as maybe student now, I identify as teacher, but is my nature, like, is that who I am really? Am I really Michael? Well, I could go change my name. I could go legally change my name. And then I would no longer be Michael. I could stop teaching, no longer a teacher, you know? And you could go through all of these processes until that Michael, who was all of those characteristics, 
that that dude's gone. And so the simple Dharma lesson is that since all of those identifiers or Lakshana are fleeting and permanent and ultimately rather constructed and therefore a little empty underneath, right? Well, the idea is, is that due to their fluctuating nature and all of that, the advice is not to identify with them, not certainly not to cling to them as that, right? Especially if you take the idea of identifying with one's job. If one's existence and identity is based on one's occupation, then getting fired is like an existential crisis because the, your very nature has been stripped. But, a, but the Buddhist move would be not to identify as your occupation, and therefore when you get fired, nothing has particularly changed in that regard, right? So there's the little practical Dharma wisdom there. Oh, but my Gulyayana. Oh, but the, but the Vajra Sutra, which is in, in a lot of scholar, including my own, a lot of scholars' opinions, the Vajra Sutra is the original Mahayana Sutra. It's like the original, like, wait, what did he just say? Did the Buddha just say what we think he just said? <laughs> it's the original one of those sutras. And in that sutra, what he says is that, that you think you're a living being <laughs> that with a lifespan and an individuated personality and a self, those are actually qualities or characteristics yet you think they are or you may think they are these um you know such deeply <laughs> true things about you right that no 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 <laughs> like that's what i am i'm a being that was born of a womb i'm living I have a personality and I'm going somewhere. But the message to Madhulyayana is the Dharma, all Dharmas, in fact, and by Dharmas here now, we mean all phenomena, a laptop computer, a truth, a person, any phenomena, all Dharmas are without sattva, sentience, sentient beingness because all dharmas are free of the dust of living beings. And the message of being free of the dust of living beings is not clinging to or being stuck with the idea of the identifier of a living being. Um, in, in, the, in the immortal words of T.S. Eliot, that which is only living can only die. It's a beautiful line of the four quartets, which is, again, it's the message of, of Anathapindika, message of Shariputra. It's Vimalakirti's message, which is that if you identify with the decaying, dying body, got bad news. The good news is, though, there's another mode of being that doesn't identify with the decaying, dying body. So questions about this i'm actually going to have to move on because i do want to get all the way through or a, a, an attempt what i want you to kind of know and i'm going to do a couple more shavakas or just a few drops in it but where we're moving towards is well i've already said it a few times but we're moving towards this deeper mahayana message of emptiness that underlying or not underlying, because that makes it sound like this substratum that's underneath everything. But it's that once investigated deeply enough, all dharmas reveal themselves to be mm, con constructs or constructions and therefore unto themselves shunyata or empty. That is, that's where we're going. Okay. Um, so just a couple more words, Madhulyayana. This is still to Madhulyayana. The Dharma is peace and quiescence because it is free from all desire. It does not become an object 
because it is free of words and letters. It is inexpressible and it transcends all movement of the mind. The reason why I wanted to say that line is that it, now where we're going, this sutra is going to start really talking about enlightenment, Buddha nature, capital R reality. And, and the one thing that I want to say about all of that is that if you think about the message I've been repeating now all evening, it's this idea of not clinging to and being free of attachment to anything in the six realms of the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, or even the brain, the mind, right? And so it's challenging. Indeed, it's quite a meditation to try to conceive of that which is beyond the eye, ear, nose, tongue, tactility, and even mentation, even ideation and thought. But enlightenment, Buddhahood, the truth, the Dharma, what they're talking about is beyond comprehension. It is truly inconceivable in that way. And so be quite aware that everything going forward is just pointing <laughs> at that which is beyond comprehension. Yeah? Okay. Um, so next up is Kashyapya. Little, uh, this is uh, Kashyapya with his begging bowl here. Uh, Kashyapya supposedly took over the Sangha after the Buddha died. And one of the stories is, is that the Buddha, that he got the Buddha's uh, uh, robes and begging bowl as signs that he was sort of the, not the leader. They're very clear that he's not the leader but he's sort of caretaker of the Sangha. He says, when the Buddha asks him, hey, why don't you go check in on the Lichavi Vimalakirti? He says, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I'm a little reluctant because one time I was out begging. He says, Lord, or World Honor One, I'm a little reluctant to go to Vimalakirti to inquire about his illness because I remember one day when I was out in the streets of the poor begging for my food, the Lichavi Vimalakirti came along and said to me, Kashyapya, to avoid the houses of the wealthy and to favor the houses of the poor, this is partiality in benevolence. Maha Kashyapya, you should dwell on the fact of the equality of all things. You should beg, you beg, you should beg your food in awareness of the ultimate non-existence of food. <laughs> and he keeps going and going and going until pretty soon, I don't know if you can see him, but little Kashyap is like, he, he doesn't even know what to do with this, right? <laughs> so then, again, just because we've had a lot of ground together here tonight, then the Buddha says to Shibuti, the star of the Diamond Sutra, the Vajra Sutra, by the way, why don't you go see Vimalakirti? And Shibuti says, World Honor One, I'm a little reluctant to go see this good man and inquire about his illness. Why is that? Well, I remember one day when I went to beg for my food at Vimalakirti's house in the great city of Vaishali. He took my bowl and filled it with some of the most excellent food and said to me, Venerable Shibuti, take this food if you understand the equality of all things. Take this food if, without abandoning greed, hatred, and delusion, you can avoid association with them. Take this food, Shibuti, if, without seeing the Buddha, Without hearing of the Dharma or without serving the Sangha, you still undertake the religious life under other masters. And what starts to happen here is that Vimalakirti starts to, to um, he basically starts to get really dark. <laughs> it starts to get really wild. And then 
right at the end, he says, Shibuti, take this food if you have hostile feelings toward all living beings. Take this food if you despise all Buddhas, if you criticize all teachings of the Buddha, if you do not rely on the Sangha. And finally, if you never, ever enter final liberation. World honored one, when I heard these words of the Lichavi Vimalakirti, I wondered what I should say and what I should do, but I was totally in the dark. Leaving my bowl, I was about to leave the house when the Lichavi Vimalakirti said to me, Venerable Shibuti, do not fear these words. Pick up your bowl. What do you think, Shibuti? If it were an if it were a phantasm created by the Buddha who just spoke thusly to you, would you be afraid? I answered, no, indeed, noble one. He then said to me, Venerable Shariputra, the nature of all things is like an illusion, like a magical phantasm. So you shouldn't fear them. Why? All words also have that nature. And thus the wise are not attached to words and they do not fear them. Why? All language does not ultimately exist except as a skillful means. The nature of all things is a liberation. When Vimalakirti had discoursed in this way, 200 gods obtained the pure Dharma vision in regard to the equality of all things without obscurity or defilement. And 500 gods obtained the conformative of tolerance. As for me, I was utterly speechless and unable to respond to him. Therefore, World Honor One, I'm a little reluctant to go see the Malakirti. So what just happened there was that we crossed over into the non -du like non-duality proper, right? Where Shariputra was like, well, no, 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 no. I swore, I've, I've sworn my life to protect the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And so Vimalakirti is challenging him in that way, pushing him up to the limit, and then it's all just words, arbitrary, artificial words that are as non-existent as anything else right so but this is this is uh we're only at number four and and re and we're tr reality is trembling <laughs> here right questions ideas comments okay so unfortunately i'm just gonna have to move ahead um so wonderful all each one of these stories is really interesting they are each they're each addressing these characters as archetypes as allegorical figures so for example the number nine rahula rahula actually was the buddha's child when he was a, a siddhartha the prince he got married had a kid then he renounced he left home right deadbeat dad he's off but he came back and he got his wife and he got his child to renounce to become monastics and they left and so rahula is an interesting figure for being the buddha's son but a renunciant and an arhat and so their discourse is about the true nature of renunciation and i just wanted to read here um at the very end of that discourse with Rahula about what does it really mean to renounce? Um, he, he says, um, but householder, we have heard the Tathaga de declare that one should not renounce the world without gaining permission from one's parents first. And the Malakirti answers, you should cultivate yourself intensely to conceive or develop the spirit of supreme unsurpassable enlightenment that in itself will be your renunciation and your high ordination All right so another mahayana twist 
where this idea of renouncing, which is to say, like shaving my head, giving up my home, joining a monastery, this sutra is saying, no, 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 <laughs> aspire for enlightenment. That's your renunciation. That's renouncing the world, right? Okay. Um, the last one is Ananda. And of course, if you've read old Pali suttas, Mahayana sutras, you know Ananda, you know, he's the young cousin of the Buddha, the most wet behind the ears, as they say. And so it's a very, very funny story that I'll just paraphrase. And the Buddha says, hey, Ananda, go check on Vimalakirti. Ananda says, no, nah, I'm, I'm a little reluctant to go check on Vimalakirti because one day the Buddha, the Buddha was ill. And so I went to go get him some milk as medicine. And I ran into Vimalakirti. And Vimalakirti basically tears me a new one, telling me I shouldn't run around saying that the Buddha's sick. Don't I know that the Buddha's body doesn't get sick? Don't I know that da 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 And so after all of this, right, um, Ananda, the Tathagatas, the Buddhas, have a body of the Dharma, not a body that is sustained by material food. The Buddhas have a transcendental body that has transcended all mundane lakshana qualities or characteristics. There is no injury to the body of a Buddha. The, then Ananda says, when I had heard these words, I, wonder if, I wondered if I had previously misheard and misunderstood the Buddha. And I was very much ashamed. But then I heard a voice from the sky say, Ananda! The household of Amalakirti speaks to you truly. Nevertheless, since the Buddha has appeared during the time of the five corruptions, he disciplines living beings by acting lowly and humble. Therefore, Ananda, do not be ashamed and go and get the milk. <laughs> That's how it ends. And go and get the milk. <laughs> so I... Just letting you know, as that whole, as we go through all 10, and as it gets more and more non-dual, more and more crazy, right? It's a beautiful ending where it's like, but don't forget the milk, right? Don't, don't drift off into complete, you know, there's even, you know, middle path here, right? Okay, so those are the Shravakas. Now we're going to go to the Bodhisattvas. Then the Buddha said to the Bodhisattva Maitreya, Maitreya, go to the Lichavi Vimalakirti and inquire about his illness. Now, if you don't know, Maitreya is the future Buddha. <laughs> Maitreya is like a Messiah. I mean, it's Easter, so let me say it. Maitreya is like the Messiah in Buddhism. He's going to like come save us all. He's the future savior Buddha, right? He currently, they say, resides in the Toshita heaven. So a realm of the, uh, a heaven of the realm of desire, actually. And interest, so he's like, he's Maitreya, right? He's like the next Buddha. Maitreya replied, world honored one, I'm a little reluctant to go to that good man and inquire about his illness. Why? World honored one, I remember that one day I was engaged in a conversation with the gods of the Tushita heaven and the god Samtushita and his retinue about I was talking to them about the stage of non-regression of the great bodhisattvas, of bodhisattvas not sliding back into ignorance. And at that time, the Lichavi Vimalakirti came, came there, came up to the Toshita heaven and addressed me as follows. Maitreya, the Buddha has prophesied that only one more birth stands between you and supreme unsurpassable enlightenment. What kind of birth does this prophecy concern, Maitreya? 
Is it a past birth? Is it a future birth? Or is it a present birth? If it's a past birth, well, then it's already happened. If it's a future birth, it will never arrive. If it is a present birth, then it cannot abide. For the Buddha has declared, bhikshus, monks, in a single moment, you are born, you age, you die, you transmigrate, and you are reborn. I got to pause there. Any questions so far? We good? Cool. So I'm going to just have to tell you rather than read it. Uh, Maitreya gets schooled in the concept of birthlessness, otherwise known as non-origination. And what this teaching of birthlessness or non-origination culminates in is something called Anudpatika Dharma Kashanti. Anudpatika Dharma Kashanti. So first, uh, Maitreya, birthlessness. So you may have heard me use the phrase or the the, yeah, the phrase, the state of deathlessness or the state of the deathless. This is a phrase used to describe the Dharma, all Dharma, old school, new school, whatever. And again, it is a, it's a life hack. It is a technique for transcending death. It's not immortality because, of course, we are not interested in, in living forever. It's not about that. We're about, this is about liberation. And so what comes along in Buddhism, and especially this, everything that's on the board, is this really profound idea of birthlessness or non-origination. So quickly, if we're talking about, if we're talking about what we perceive to be living beings, then we're talking about birthlessness. Your birthlessness, my birthlessness, the birthlessness of all sentient beings. If we're talking about what we perceive to be inanimate objects, whiteboards, books, laptops, then we would use the term non-origination. Doesn't come from anywhere. Now, I tried to be careful in my language because I already dropped on you the idea that perceiving something as sentient or a living being is just a kind of a lakshana, a quality that we perceive something happening. We see movement and we go, oh, look, must be sentient. We see stillness and we say, oh, look, must be insentient. Well, so. So birthlessness or non-origination doesn't matter. What we're talking about is that things, phenomena, you and me and the laptop and everything else doesn't come from anywhere and doesn't go anywhere. This is birthlessness or non-origination. And without, without spending too much time on it because I don't have that much time, the idea is, is that if you really, really grok, you really, really kind of understand this idea of emptiness and that all phenomena, all phenomena being these kind of um, little piles of lakshana, little piles of qualities. And from these little piles of qualities, we discern, oh, that's a laptop. I've seen one of those before. Oh, that's a whiteboard. It's white and you can write on it. So if you perceive, if you grok or understand that all phenomena are perceived little piles of lakshana and that underneath that little pile, it's like a house of cards. There's no actual there there, no actual self. This is what's called anatman. Well, if you just spend a little moment on that idea of like, oh, well, there's nothing there then. 
it's all kind of an illusion or a figment of my imagination based on this kind of lakshana party. Well, then that means the perceived object doesn't come from anywhere. It has, it has no origination. It is not born from anywhere. It's not going anywhere. <laughs> right? And the idea of that, that all things are without origin, in a sense, uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to meditate on this, if you just want an additional meditation on how to think of this, um, I would encourage you to think of a, of a, of a dream, uh, of a dream, and think of some person that you encountered in a dream. You, in the dream, you were convinced it was reality. And so you saw something moving, talking, had the lakshana of a sentient being. And so you perceived it as a being and maybe you even engaged it in conversation, right? The question becomes th that dream person you were talking to, where, where, where were they born? Well, to, th to think of them as that kind of being and to start wondering, yeah, where, where were they born? Some sort of dream mother? Was there some sort of dream maternity ward? There was no dream maternity ward. There's no dream mother, right? It's, it's that that being wasn't born. It's a, it's a misunderstanding of their nature. Well, the Buddha is saying we misunderstand the nature of everything. And so the true nature of everything is that kind of emptiness and therefore the birthlessness or non-origination of all phenomena. Now, if you're cool with that, if you're like, oh, that's, oh, that's, um, hmm. But you, you have a patient endurance for that. A kashanti, there is a level of bodhisattva development that is the patient endurance for the non-origination of all dharmas. The anudpatika. So if you're familiar with uh, pratitya samutpata, dependent origination, well, sam udpata, sam means the same, Samudpata means that they were, they meaning whatever things, me, you, the lats or whatever, they were dependently originated. They were Sam, right? Samudpatika. But this is Anudpatika. No origination. No, no dependent origination. Because there's nothing there to begin with. <laughs> That's the message of birthlessness that the, the Malakirti gives to the future Buddha Maitreya. In response to this idea of, hey, Maitreya, <laughs> who's getting re reborn? What's getting reborn? Where? To whom? When? Right? Okay. So there are three more bodhisattvas in this chapter. A Lichavi named Prabhavyuha. Shining arrangement, shining array, right? And there is this wonderful thing where he says, um, I'm not going to go see the Malakirti. The Buddha's like, why not? And Prabhavyuha says, well, I ran into the Malakirti one day, and he said he was coming from the seat of enlightenment. Now, the seat of enlightenment is a, it's a Buddhist expression for that sacred spot under the Bodhi tree of enlightenment, where the Buddha defeated Mara and achieved enlightenment. The seat of enlightenment is that sacred spot underneath trees where Buddhas get enlightened. But what's interesting is that when questioned by Prabhavyuha, where he's like, the seat of enlightenment, like, whoa, where's where? Like, where's the, where's the tree? He says, uh, da, 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 da. the seat of enlightenment is a seat of positive thought because it is without artificiality. And by artificiality, they actually mean lakshana, qualities or characteristics. It is the seat of effort because it releases energetic activities. 
It is the seat of high resolve. It is the seat of generosity. It is the seat of love because it is equal to all living beings. It is the seat of compassion because it tolerates all injuries. It is the seat of joy because it is joyfully devoted to the bliss of the Dharma. And so he goes on and on and on and on where you really, oh, the seat of enlightenment is everywhere at all times, always. I, 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 it's a great injustice I'm doing here to this. I mean, these things are so beautiful, you know, and I would love to just, in particular, number three, Jagitam Dara. Jagitam Dara, a crazy name. It's a whole big old crazy story about how Mara, the devil, disguises himself as Indra, God, and, and gifts, gifts these maidens to this bodhisattva. And this bodhisattva, it's like a weird human trafficking story that actually might be about human trafficking or something. But it's really weird where he's like, I'm not going to take your maidens and, and Indra, i.e. the devil's like, no, go ahead and take them. It's okay. And it gets really weird. And ultimately, Vimalakirti comes in and teaches everybody the Dharma and liberates them. It's a wild story. It, and it's many pages. So I'm not even going to attempt it. But I just want you to know it's wild. The fourth and final Bodhisattva of chapter four is the Bodhisattva Sudatta. That's right, folks, Anatha Pindika. And if you remember, at the end of the Anatha Pindika Sutra, Anatha Pindika died, or at least that body or whatever died, and he became a god, a Bodhisattva. And so here he makes his appearance. And because I have this whole thesis, the Anatha Pindika Code, that says the Vimalakirti is a Mahayana version of the Anatha Pindika Sutra. Surprise, surprise, we see him. This is a beautiful section as well, where Vimalakirti schools Sudatta, Anatha Pindika, on Dharma offerings, on making offerings of the Dharma. For anybody reading the Thurman translation, I want you to know that he uses the word sacrifice, a Dharma sacrifice. And I'm really, it's, it's one place where I'm really opposed to that translation. And, I, and I'm opposed to it as an anthropologist, scholar of religion. That word sacrifice has so much in terms of its Latin Christian origins. And then of course the Abrahamic sacrifice of Isaac and this idea of giving something dear and all this stuff, that mode, and I'm not putting down sacrifice, I'm not putting down that mode of, of, of it's like, oh, I have this thing that's dear to me, but I'm gonna give it up as a sacrifice. That's not what's going on here. Anatha Pindika is the king of offerings. He just gave and gave and gave. And so in this section, when it's using this language of Dharma sacrifice and that he's like the best sacrificer, he actually even uses that word sacrificer. It all gets very like, it's unfortunate because I think it misses the, the underlying message of Dana or don, donor donation, which is the message of Anatha Pindika and this whole thing. So if you read that section in which Vimalakirti says, this is what an offering of the Dharma is. This is what an offering of the Dharma is. Know that that's what they're talking about, not sacrifice in, in that language. Okay. So we're going to have to just get there. We've got 20 minutes, folks. Um, so then, the Buddha said to the crown prince of the Dharma, Manjushri, right? He's got his little crown. He said, Manjushri, why don't you go to the Lichavi Vimalakirti and inquire about his illness? Manjushri replied, world honored one, it is difficult to attend upon the Lichavi Vimalakirti. He is gifted with marvelous eloquence concerning the Dharma of the profound. 
He is extremely skilled in, in full expressions and in the reconciliation of all dichotomies. His eloquence is inex inexorable and no one can resist his imperturbable intellect. He accomplishes all the activities of the bodhisattvas. He penetrates all the secret mysteries of the bodhisattvas and all the Buddhas. He is skilled in civilizing all the abodes of all Maras. He plays with the great super knowledges. He is consummate in wisdom and skillful means. He has attained the supreme excellence of, of the indivisible non-dual sphere of the realm of reality. He is skilled in teaching the Dharma with its infinite modalities within the uniform ultimate. He's skilled in granting means of attainment in accordance with the spiritual faculties of all living beings. He has attained decisiveness with regard to all questions. Thus, although he cannot be withstood by someone of my feeble defenses, still sustained by the grace of the Buddha, I will go to him and will converse with him as well as I can. So Manjushri steps up to the plate. Thereupon, in that assembly, the bodhisattvas, the great disciples, the chakra gods, the brahma gods, the lokapala gods, and the gods and the goddesses of the heavens, all had this thought. Surely the conversation of the young prince Mandrashri and that good man, Vimalakirti, will result in a profound teaching of the Dharma. Indeed they will. Thus, 8,000 bodhisattvas, 500 disciples, a great number of chakras, brahmas, lokapalas, and many hundreds of thousands of gods and goddesses all followed the crown prince of the Dharma, Manjushri, to listen to his exchange with the Malakirti. Meanwhile, the Lichavi, the Malakirti, thought to himself, Manjushri, the crown prince of the Dharma, He's coming here with, with an enormous attendance. Now, may this house be transformed into emptiness. Then, magically, his house became empty. Even the doorkeeper disappeared. And, except for the invalid's couch, upon which Vimalakirti himself was lying, no bed or couch or seat could be seen anywhere. Then the Lichavi Vimalakirti saw the crown prince Manjushri and addressed him thus. Manjushri! Welcome, Manjushri! You are very welcome! There you are, without any coming. You appear, without any seeing. You are heard, without any hearing. Manjushri declared, Householder, it is as you say, who comes, finally comes not. Who goes, finally goes not. How is this? Who comes is not known to come. Who goes is not known to go. Who appears is finally not to be seen. Good sir, is your condition tolerable? Is it livable? Are your physical ailments not disturbed? Is your sickness diminishing? Is it not increasing? The Buddha asks about you. If you have slight trouble, slight discomfort, slight illness, if your distress is light, if you are cared for, strong, at ease, without self-reproach, and if you are living in touch with supreme happiness. Manjushri asked, Householder, from whence came this sickness of yours? How long will it continue? How does it stand? How can it be alleviated? Vimalakirti replied, Manjushri, my sickness comes from ignorance and the thirst for existence and it will last as long as do the sicknesses of all living beings. Were all living beings to be free from illness, I also would not be ill. How's that? 
Manjushri, for the Bodhisattva, the world consists only of living beings. And sickness is inherent in the living world. Were all living beings free from sickness, the Bodhisattva also would be free from sickness. For example, Manjushri, when the only child of a family is sick, the parents become sick on account of the sickness of their child. And the parents will suffer as long as the child does not recover from its Ill sickness. Just so, Manjushri, the Bodhisattva loves all beings as if each were her only child. She becomes sick when they are sick, and she is cured when they are cured. You ask me, Manjushri, from whence comes my sickness? The sickness of the Bodhisattvas arise from their great compassion. I'm jumping over a little bit. It gets really technical. They get like Hegelian crazy for a second. But then, householder, of what sort is your sickness? It is immaterial and invisible. Is it physical or mental, Manjushri asked. It is not physical, since the body is insubstantial. It is not mental, since the nature of the mind is like an illusion. Manjushri asked, Householder, which of the four elements is disturbed? Earth, water, fire, or air? The Malakirti replied, Manjushri, I am sick only because the elements of all living beings are disturbed by sickness. Manjushri asked, Householder, how should a bodhisattva console another bodhisattva who is sick? The Malakirti replied, She should tell him that the body is impermanent, but that he should not, ex but that, but should not exhort him to renunciation or disgust of that body. She should tell him that the body is miserable, but should not encourage him to find solace in liberation. She should tell him that the body is selfless, but that living beings should still be developed, that the body is peaceful, but not to seek any ultimate calm. She should urge him to confess evil deeds, but not for the sake of their absolution. She should encourage his empathy for all living beings on account of his own sickness, his remembrance of suffering experienced from beginningless time, and his consciousness of working for the welfare of all living beings. She should encourage him not to be distressed, but to manifest the roots of virtue, to maintain a state of original purity and to lack craving, and thus to always strive to become a king of healers who can cure all sicknesses. Thus should a bodhisattva console a sick bodhisattva in such a way as to make him happy. Manjushri asked, Noble sir, how should a sick bodhisattva control her own mind? Vimalakirti replied, Manjushri, a sick bodhisattva should control her own mind with the following consideration. Sickness arises from total involvement in the process of misunderstanding from beginningless time. It arises from the passions that result from unreal mental constructions, and hence, ult and hence, ultimately, nothing is perceived which can be said of to be sick. How's that? The body is the issue of the four great elements, and in these elements there is no owner, no agent. There is no self in this body. And except for arbitrary insistences of self, ultimately no I, ego, which can be said to be sick, can be apprehended. Therefore, thinking I 
should not adhere to any self, and I should rest in the knowledge of the root of illness. She should abandon the conception of herself as a personality and produce the conception of herself as a construction of things. Thinking, this body is an aggregation of many things. When it is born, only things are born. When it ceases, only things cease. These things have no awareness, no sensations of each other. When they are born, they do not think, I am born. When they cease, they do not think, I cease. Furthermore, the Bodhisattva should understand thoroughly the conception of herself as a construction of things by cultivating the following consideration. Just as in the case of the conception of a self, so the conception of things is also a misunderstanding. And this misunderstanding is also a grave sickness. I should free myself from this sickness and should strive to abandon it. What is the abandonment or the elimination of sickness? It is the elimination of egotism, of the I, and possessiveness. What is the elimination of egoism, the I, and possessiveness? It is the freedom from all dualisms. What is the freedom from dualism? It is the absence of involvement with either the external or the internal. What is the absence of involvement with either the external or the internal? It is non-deviation, non-fluctuation, and non-distraction from total equanimity. What's equanimity? It is the equality of everything from self all the way to liberation. How's that? Because both self and liberation are empty. How can both be empty or void? As verbal designations, they are both empty and neither is established in any reality. Therefore, one who sees such equality makes no difference between sickness and emptiness. Her sickness is itself emptiness, and that sickness as emptiness is itself empty. Okay. There is, of course, a lot more, folks. Um, this goes on, this process of the bodhisattva eliminating the self of sickness through this process of sort of dissolving through non-duality and non-dualism into emptiness and therefore kind of emptying out even sickness itself, the haver of sickness, all of that, finally culminates in... Da, da, da. Okay, well, it finally culminates in the establishment of a domain where one realizes that all the Buddha lands, the Buddha fields, are indestructible and uncreatable having the nature of infinite space, yet where one manifests the establishment of the qualities of the Buddha fields in all their variety and magnitude. Such is the domain of the Bodhisattva, the domain where one turns the wheel of the Holy Dharma 
and manifest the magnificence of ultimate liberation, yet never, ever, ever forsakes the career of the Bodhisattva. Such is the domain of the Bodhisattva. And when Vimalakirti had spoken this discourse, 8,000 of the gods in the company of the crown prince of the Dharma, Manjushri, conceived the spirit of unsurpassable, complete enlightenment. <laughs> okay. So somehow we did that. Questions, answers, or ideas, comments, epiphanies. Uh, would it be possible to, like, you always have these great notes on the board, and um, it isn't, you know, especially with the um, the Zoom, it's not always easy to, like, yep. see everything or what it's written. Would it be possible for you to take take a picture and post it somewhere? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Like, cause I will do that. It, there's all there's lots of great stuff there, and um, in terms of comments on like what you, we just went through, there's just a lot to grok. <laughs> so, yeah, it's you know, playtime's over, right? <laughs> um, yeah, and I, I mean, I hope my my sincere hope is that was still elucidating, and not obfuscating in that way. Because, it, yeah, it's deep, so I hope I gave you a taste for its depth, not, you know, utter uh, confoundment, you know? Yeah, no, no, it's it's very, I want to go back and, like, rewatch this and then, like, read some of the sutta. There's, there's yeah, a lot there. Yeah, and I decided, like, like I said, I decided this one to read, try to read less and just explain more so that you could go back and read it. You know, the sutra gets... Um, this sutra gets noted a lot for the humor. It's very funny. Now, many sutras are funny, but this one is almost like, like comedy. You know, there's a lot of funny stuff going on. So this whole, you know, the reluctance of them to go see him and even, even Maitreya, it's all supposed to be really funny. You know, and, and in a way like, you know, lighthearted in that way, because, you know, when I made the remark about, about Maitreya being the Messiah, it's like, I wanted to drive home the idea that for some people, like, it's a very, very holy figure. And so for this sutra to be, to have him be a, a what's the, you know, a foil to be a, that's like Maitreya? A foil, but that but that again is is part of its charm and humor, right? Yeah, definitely. It's like I'm not going. <laughs> <laughs> and and there's a lot of a lot of comments have been made about the particular language, which is that none of them say no, mm -hmm. and that would that would be very like oh, okay. uh, disrespectful to the Buddha to say no. So they all phrase it in this way of like, I'd rather not. <laughs> Any other questions, comments, or insights? A quick question. Hi, Michael. Hi. Hi, Michael. So we, like we like to read the chapters uh, before. So do you know which one you, how far you will go next week? Thank you. On that note, we're on easy street because we're basically doing one chapter from here on out. I think okay. later on down the road, I'll, I do another night where we do two. But so next time it is only this beautiful chapter on the inconceivable or the liberation of inconceivability. So that's the only thing we're gonna do next week. Perfect, thanks. Yeah. Um, and on that note, too, of course, the fun continues on Thursday night, 7.30, uh, with Michael Taft. And so um, he'll obviously be going, uh, taking you deeper. I found his meditation very profound on Thursday. I, I, like many of you, probably was curious how 
how does Michael Taff do a Vimalakirti meditation? Is he going to, you know, bust up the parasols? Like, what, you know, what's going to happen? And I did want to just remark that sitting there going, meditate, doing the meditation, even, even this guy, teaching the stuff, doing the thing, eat, and I don't know how many of you were there for his meditation, but upon this suggestion to view all things as perfectly fine just as they are, I had the Shariputra reaction of, no, Michael Taft, things are, everything is not perfect. Uh, and and it was, so it was a very profound meditation for me to have the Shariputra denial of the purity of the Buddha land and through Michael's beautiful guided meditation come to the clarity of that, of that, that again, that, that beautiful idea of purity, not pure versus impure, but just fine as it is. It doesn't need anything, you know, so beautiful. So I really, I can't wait. I can't wait to see what he does, what he does next time. So, all right, folks, that's it for me. Thank you, Michael. Oh, my Thank pleasure. You, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Thanks.